Sunrise Safari. It's been a crisp, cold morning, and we're out on live safari in Juma and Arethusa game reserves in the Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Not only are we live, but we are also interactive, so you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. For those of you who don't know us, my name is Jamie, and I have jean on camera with me this morning. Brent is out on Rusty with Dave on camera, and together we will be perusing the wilds of Africa to find wonderful things to show you. Now, speaking of wonderful things to show you, sometimes the show doesn't always end the way that, or when, it, when we say it's going to end. Last night, we'd finished off the show, we'd closed down, and we were driving back home, Viam and myself, and we spotted a very unusual animal to see on live safaris. It has been seen a couple of times before. Nevertheless, it was the, fir it was the first for me, and you can hear absolute excitement in my voice if you watch a replay of the clip. And luckily, we have a clip prepared for you, so you can have a look at what we went live with last night after the sunset safari. Have a look. for those of you who are watching how awesome is this of my first live serval sighting the spots disappearing off behind into the trees this is so epic look at its long ears a medium-sized cheetah-like cat we've just been speaking with Brent about all the different cats you could see out here and we've stumbled across a really relaxed individual Let's try and sneak a little bit closer. Oh, I'm so excited. Wait, hold on, it might move out into the open. It's foraging, it's hunting. And I cannot believe it hasn't run away from us. This is about this, or just larger than your domestic cats, a little bit larger. Here it goes, the slightly shorter tail shorter than a cheetah or a leopard or a big, another one of the big cats. This is such an exciting sighting. Isn't that the most beautiful, graceful creature you have ever seen? How exciting was that? You can definitely hear that I am overjoyed to be seeing a serval. It's the first time I've seen one on Juma. I've seen quite a few, but that was definitely a nice surprise to enjoy our drive. Viam's grin was spread from ear to ear. We were on our way home, so Viam had his phone out and his torch out. He was busy sorting things out in the back of the vehicle. Those went flying into the back, and off we went in pursuit of that serval. And what was so wonderful about that sighting, what made even more excited, was it was not a flash of spot running away from us, but actually a nice relaxed cat wandering, just going about its nicely business. I'm in the area now. I, I don't think necessarily we have a high chance of bumping into it, but you just never know on these cool autumn mornings. On this cool autumn, autumn evening, we were also following up on alarm calls yesterday evening that Steph had heard, and we discovered, to our surprise, that Mvula was seen walking down Vuyatela Main Access after we'd closed the show at about 9 o'clock last night. So I know that Brent has been on the lookout for him, so let's pop over to him so that he can say good morning and tell you all about his search. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Wasn't that incredible? After the end of drive last night, Jamie and Viam spotting that serval. So, I have spotted cat tracks of a different kind this morning, and uh, I got a report from Yours in Buffalo's Hook that he found Mvula on the main access road in Juma uh, after drive at about 8.30 last night. So, I found the tracks and it's difficult enough tracking on these, this hard ground in daylight, 
But so far, we're doing okay in the dark. And I couldn't see where the tracks disappeared to. So Jamie's checking to the east around quarantine, and I'm checking to the north around Gallego shortcut. And we had some excited hyena calls in this area a bit earlier. That could be just hyenas. There's monkeys alarming at the Juma camp. Thank you, Lucy in Indiana. We're on our way. So, come on, leopards. Wouldn't it be fantastic to get a leopard in the sunrise? It would make me very excited. Spotlight, check. Cameraman, I've got one today. I haven't left it behind. And you can see that magnificent color up ahead. And I've got a feeling this morning is going to be one of those really special mornings. It's beautiful colors up in the sky. And uh, I might be wrong, but I think I'm on. Uh, the weather has changed now. We've definitely had a, a drop in temperature. It's a, quite a bit cooler in the mornings and through the day. So I think the rains might be over and we're moving into winter. Uh, we don't really have uh, four seasons like you do in the northern hemisphere. We've pretty much got two seasons out here. We've got hot and cold, well, what we consider cold, and we've got wet and dry, even though this wet season has been a particularly dry one. So even though we've had this late rain, it's still, I don't think, enough to carry a lot of the animals through the long, dry season. So if I'm correct, we're probably not going to get any more heavy rain. We might get some the odd drizzle and cloudy day with a cold front, but nothing big. And the next time we're probably going to be seeing rain will be in November. So let's go have a look at that magnificent sunrise with Jamie. I mentioned that it has a beautiful, crisp, clear morning, and it has provided us with the most spectacular sunset. And while you look at that, Brent just wants to chat to me on the Game Drive channel. Standing by. Uh, Zoe's Road at the two-track junction. Is there anywhere you want me specifically to check? Copy. Just discussing our plan of attack, so to speak, for this morning. I'm going to do a quick circuit to help Brent out, and then I'm going to move further to the north to see if the wild dogs decide to come further south again. Isn't that absolutely stunning? There's always that excitement first thing in the morning, being out in the bush as the light is coming up, wondering what mysteries have unfolded themselves during the evening. And of course, knowing that a lot of exciting creatures are moving about at night. Michelle has just commented on our serval sighting, saying that the serval looks like a cross between a bobcat and a leopard. Oh, Michelle, that's a fair description, although I think the closer one to a bobcat mix would be the caracal with the black tufts of hair on the edge of their ears. That's also something we could get on our live safaris. I'm sure that we could manage to, at some point, do that for you. You just have to keep watching. The longer we're out here, the more hours we spend, the more likely such sightings would be. Now, for me, a serval is like a cross, cat, a cross between a cheetah and a domestic cat, almost. Now, Paul, you were wondering if they are territorial because you saw one at the end of drive with Brent. Paul, 
as far as I know, that was a civet that was seen with Brent, which, yes, is a territorial beast and walks very set, regular pathways. That being said, you, there's a chance that regular viewers, such as yourself, might have seen a serval in this area before. Apparently, it has been seen regularly around the Zoe's Road clearing, which is exactly where we are now. And it was just wondering about, as I said, going about its nightly business. Now, we're either seeing that serval that you've been seeing in this area is either the same serval or it's one of a pair that you've been seeing regularly. They are, they do move about and they do have set little territories that they utilize. Now, a serval, of course, famed for its incredible jumping ability. Mm, isn't that a beautiful morning? And at 26 degrees, which is, sorry, no, 20 degrees, which is 68 degrees Fahrenheit, it's crisp and clear and cold. And exactly everything we want out of a morning safari. Alrighty, well, Brent has arrived to follow up on those alarm calls, and at the moment he's got another beautiful view of the sunrise, so let's hop on the back of his, his vehicle. So, we've rushed down here. It seems the monkeys have stopped, so we're just keeping quiet and trying to hear if there's anything else. Ah. Hardy da Ibis. <laughs> Crested Franklin, Red Bull Buffalo even in the tree next to us. Starlings. Babblers. indicate where this leopard might be. Ah! But it is a spectacular morning. Jamie, Jamie. Standing by. Jamie, those monkeys have stopped alarm alarming. I don't know if you want to check down towards Twin Dams or maybe Philemon's Pangolin track and then up towards Twin, Twin Dams. I'll check in Vubu. Copy that. That was exactly my plan. And then I'll start going northeast from there. Copy. Okay, so we can't hear anything. Let's move on. So Megan is wondering what is the difference between a leopard and a jaguar? Well, first things first, jaguars don't occur in Africa. They occur in South and Central America. And fascinating about jaguars, they are re-extending some of their range into the southern United States, where they have been extinct, locally extinct for a while. So that's very good news. Uh, jaguars are much bigger than leopards. A big male jaguar will probably be about the size of a lioness. And uh, they are good climbers, probably not as good as leopards because they are a bit heavier. Let me just check for tracks here quickly. Uh, and also, probably one of the biggest difference out of the spotted panthera cats. Uh, uh, jaguars are great lovers of water and will actually even often hunt in the water. Hang on, sorry. 
is that track? It's right on the edge on the slightly hard soil, and then this light is just quite difficult, so let me just double check it, sorry. So the reason I hold the spotlight low is to try throw a shadow so I can see the actual shape of the track. It's just a hyena track on the hard edge. So Jago is quite a bit bigger, but they are cousins, so to speak. They belong to the family Panthera, and the animals that belong to the family Panthera are able to roar, and they are able to do this by a modified uh, bone in their throats. Uh, it is called the hyoid apparatus, and in small cats, that bone is a solid. It's ossified, it's a solid bone, and in the Panthera cat, it is cartilaginous, it's elastic, and the vibration of that bone is what causes them to be able to roar. So, members of the Panthera family, lion, leopard, jaguar, and tiger. So there we go, looking back towards the lodge, can't see anything there. Keep checking. There's the moon off to the left. On its way down to set. So when it is full moon, the moon will set at the exact same time as the sun rises, and vice versa. It will rise at the exact same time the sun sets. Maryland, morning Robin, would like to know how do you tell the difference between a civet and a genet? Well, it's quite easy. A genet is very, very small in comparison to a civet and uh, quite more ornately marked. So I'm just trying to make sure we don't miss any tracks here. I will show you a picture just now. At the moment, I'm worried to take my eyes off the road in case I do miss a track, and that could put us a little bit behind in our finding of the leopard this morning. So while we check to the north in front of the Vuyatela camp. Uh, let's jump on with Jamie for an update. Well, I'm helping Brain to follow up on the signs of Mvula moving through the area, but just have a look at this incredible scene as our full moon sets. you can't smell it, the bush finally has that summer smell that I always associate it with. A mixture of damp and sort of composty type plant material and the various flowers releasing their scents. Plus the peace of all of the birds calling. And it's amazing how there's lots of surface level noise in the bush. But underneath that, there's this vast almost blanket-like silence. One of my favorite things about being out here. Well, 
Well, one of the reasons why I've suggested going to the north to look for wild dogs is the fact that although they were very far away yesterday afternoon, the vehicles were viewing them right up in the northeastern corner of the Buffelshook property, so the property to the north of us, very close to Kruger National Park. The reason that I'm suggesting going that way is because full moon nights are a little bit different from other nights out here in the bush. So on a full moon night, there's plenty of ambient light, and it means that for animals like cheetah and wild dog, they can actually move about far more than they would usually at other times of the month. So there's the chance that the wild dogs have started moving back across in our direction. And it's that wonderful time when diurnal and nocturnal animals start to mix and you can see all, have the possibility of seeing all of them around. And just to go back to our serval sighting, Romy, good morning, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering, where do servals hide during the day? And what do they eat? And the answer to that, Romy, is they generally hide up around perfectly thick drainage line systems. Now, we hardly ever encounter them when we're tracking on foot. This would be a lovely hiding place for a serval. Somewhere down in the depths of a drainage line, in a rock crevice, or indeed, just finding a nice spot underneath a quarry bush to hide out for the day. That being said, they do also move about during the day at certain times, and they will hunt during the day. So they're not totally nocturnal, just in the same way leopards are not totally nocturnal. They are opportunists. And they're going to head out, and they're going to catch things like birds, frogs, rodents. Their speciality is this immensely powerful upward jump straight vertically into the air, many times their height, and I'm sure you would be able to find some clips of that on YouTube, launching themselves into the air to catch flying Franklin or guinea fowl, or anything like that. And chances of them catching something like a monkey is maybe a bit slimmer. They're not really, although they can climb trees, they're not really tree climbing cats. Not quite to the same degree that something like a caracal might be. And they are most definitely within the Felidae family, so a member of the cat family. They've got retractable claws and they're capable of a wide range of vocal sounds as well. Chirps and purrs. They're just, they're not classified as panthera though, so they're not, a, they're not a roaring cat, which makes sense when you see them. I mean, to give you a sense of scale, I think I mentioned in that clip that they are about twice the size of your average domestic cat. Uh, it depends, of course, on the breed of cat, but shoulder height, about yay big. That short tail tells us immediately that they are not a cat, that first of all, they're not a cat that climbs trees, it's not an, a, an instrument of balance, and they're not a cheetah that runs or sprints, is capable of sprinting and turning sharp corners very quickly. You can see a lot about a serval from the way in which they're structured. But That's wonderful news. Megan's been, Megan's been watching for a week. First of all, Megan wanted to know about servals. Do they den in trees or on the ground? Where do they sleep? Megan, I've only ever found servals sleeping on the ground before. I have never seen them sleeping in a tree. They've got, proportionately, they've got quite long legs compared to their body size. They're not as comfortable in lying up in a tree in the same way that a leopard might be. And just as an interesting aside, it is very common for serval to be, or it's fair, relatively common for serval to be killed by leopards. They kill them as, to reduce competition, as with all members of the predator family, if they have an opportunity to attack each other, they will, to reduce competition for themselves and for their own offspring. And I believe that according to Viam, he actually had a sighting where Shadow had killed a serval at some point last year. That does sometimes occur. 
they don't quite sort of they don't quite match up to the agility and speed of a leopard but those long legs not really built for tree climbing in the same way cheetahs long legs are not built for tree climbing cheetahs don't often they can they can climb trees but they're certainly not geared for it in the same way a leopard has that tremendous agility in moving about the branches and boughs of the larger tree species now so far the only tracks i've seen is an elephant that i am reverse tracking and several large hyenas wandering through so at least we know which way mbula didn't go last night Let's find out if Brent is having any more success than I am. So no fresh tracks yet. Just those initial ones we saw up on Vuyatela Access. And uh, the monkeys aren't alarming anymore. So I think I'm going to head back to where I was and keep with my original plan. So what we're doing is we, we drive for 100, 200 meters, switch off, listen for 30 seconds, and keep on repeating, just in case there is some noise I'm not picking up or some sounds I'm not picking up over the noise of the engine. So Mia is planning a safari, it sounds like, and Mia would like to know, what do I recommend? A self-drive through Kruger or spending some time at a private lodge? Well, Mia, if you can afford it, the best way to see the animals is to go to a private lodge. You have guides and trackers who are able to find those animals for you. And you will still see animals in Kruger, but you might not see them, and you're definitely not going to see them as close. So one of the biggest benefits about being in a private lodge in a private area is the fact that you can off-road and you can night drive. So you cannot off-road anywhere in Kruger and night drives are conducted uh, on the, in Kruger but along the main roads and you will have multiple spotlights in the vehicle and the guests get to shine them and this is a wonderful experience, yes. But I, myself, if I was spending a lot of money on, on, a, on a big trip, I would definitely go for the use of experts in finding animals. So even if I go somewhere and I haven't been to that area before, I will definitely use local guides. And uh, if I can afford it, go to, to a private area, as well as sometimes coupling it with a self-drive. But it's a little bit different for me. I know where, where to look at what time of the day. But I think it is definitely worthwhile doing that extra. So if I, for example, if I go fishing somewhere and I've never been fishing there before, I will hire a local expert uh, for a day or two. It is worthwhile and it, you do enhance your experience by more than tenfold, twentyfold. Also, it depends on what time of the year you want to go. Um, and for me, the best time, although it is beautiful when it's green, uh, and the animals are always here, yeah, one must remember that, but it is a little bit more difficult to find them uh, in, when it's green and lush. Uh, my personal best time of the year to be on safari if I'm conducting private safaris, which I don't do too much of anymore, is uh, I would always recommend the end of October, beginning of November uh, in, in Southern Africa. This is the end of the dry season. So there's not much grass around, there's not much water around. So the animals are more concentrated also. Uh, you can see much further into the bush, making it much easier to find a lot of the interesting species. But of course, if you're a birder, then the green season that we're in now, is the best because you've got all the migrants uh, 
lots of little fruiting trees. So the birding is better when it's green, but the big game viewing is better when it's dry. So, uh, Megan, who's only been watching for a week, said she's already booked her ticket and she's sifting through lodge prizes. She looks forward to meeting all of us. Megan, well, we look forward to meeting you. And uh, congratulations on planning your trip to Africa. Now, I can't exactly remember who this quote is by, but it's one of my favorite quotes. And it actually sits on the bottom of my email. And it says, if you, if you only visit two continents, continents in your life, visit Africa twice. Okay, so we have checked this area, but we checked it in the dark, so I'm still going to check it again, but then I'm going to make my way through to the northern boundary. And uh, just from Mvula's behavior over the last while, he's been spending a lot of time in this, this sort of zone here, and he is trying to sort of hang on the peripheries. So that area we found him in is basically the boundary between two different male leopards. So he's sort of trying to find a little sliver of land that they're not occupying at the moment to try to avoid confrontation with Tingana and that unrelaxed male from the north. So he's been ousted from almost all of his original territory. And uh, when he was in his prime, he held one of the biggest male leopard territories in the Sabi Sands. Now, a lot of you will think, oh, he must be the best leopard when he was in his prime because he held the biggest territory. This, however, is not true. So. big river areas, so the Sand and Sabi River is better leopard habitat than where we are now. And that's not to say there are not a lot of leopards here, there are. But there are more leopards along those major rivers. And a very fascinating thing if you look at the, the average home range or territory size for leopards in the Sabi Sands. And uh, if you look for a female leopard in the north where we are, uh, it can it's normally around a thousand to 2,000 two, 2, hectares. Karula holds one of the biggest female territories. And that's, of course, because of uh, prey density. So the southern Sabi Sands has a lot more impala. And they also have a little bit less lions. Uh, the northern Sabi Sands is very, very good for lions. It's got the highest density of lions in the Sabi Sands. But it's got one of the lower leopard densities. Now, still much higher than most other places in Africa, but, but still. so. As I was saying, so let's say Karula has got a 2,000 hectare, so just over 4,000 acre territory. So she can cover quite a lot of ground looking around and marking and making sure no other females sneak into her territory. And Mvula had a massive territory of over 2,500 hectares. Now, if we move on to the Sand River, for example, your average female uh, territory or home range there is only 600 hectares. So less than half of the average female territory in this area, and the male territories are around 1,000 hectares. Again, about 50% in this area. That's because uh, on the river there, they've got lots of ideal habitats. They've also got lots of food species, so lots of Inyala, Bushbuck, and Impala in those areas. So the leopard territories can be smaller because they don't need as much ground to get uh, all the, the food they need. Uh, so very, very interesting how different areas you'll have different home, right, home ranges. So it's very, very difficult to be exact. So uh, a lot of animal behavior can be area specific rather than species specific. So leopards and lions and the Sabi Sands might behave in certain ways, not, of course, most of the behavior will be the same, uh, in certain ways, completely different to in Botswana or in, in Zambia or even in other parts of South Africa. But we're going to go check along the northern boundary, see if we can find any tracks there. While we do that, uh, let's jump back on board with Jamie. I think that Brent has potentially taken my route plan. That's okay. We can change ours very easily. 
I just wanted to give you a picture of a serval in comparison to a human body. The dark shadow, of course, being the body of a regular sized person. And then a couple of other small cat species that you could see here. If we have a look just above it, if we have a look at the caracal compared to the serval body structure, you can get an idea. The caracal is a stocky creature, thick forelimbs, almost leopard-like build to it. And there you can see what I mean by the tufts of the ear at the top. Whereas compared to this body structure of the serval, look how much longer a serval is. They're roughly the same height, but they look much more lanky with those large radar-like ears in order for locating shuffling birds and rodents out here. So the only other thing that we could see out here, well, we could see any small, small or large spotted genets, and we could see the southern African wildcat is also a possibility. I haven't seen one here yet. I would very much like to. And that looks very much like a domestic cat, and in fact is the ancestor of our domestic pet cats. Here we go. Here's an actual picture of a serval with its large ears. In Afrikaans, it's known as a tierbos cat, which literally translated means a tiger bush cat, which has always entertained me slightly. Definitely doesn't look like a tiger in any way. You can see the short tail, long legs. Oh, we had a little bit of confusion where it comes to the civet, but before I do that, Matthew, wanted a picture of our striped polecat and we got somewhat distracted last night. We were talking about skunks and their relatives in Africa. This is what a striped polecat looks like, Matthew. Now, they can use a vile, in, to quote this book directly, a vile smelling secretion of their anal glands as defense against predators. They're very similar to what a skunk can do, but they can't quite spray it in the way that a skunk can do as well. So it's not quite the same excretory explosion, but nevertheless is certainly a very similar approach to their defensiveness. And I just wanted to find, I had the page a moment ago. Where did I put it? Where have I hidden it from myself? Ah, there we go. This is the civet that Brent saw and the night before we saw that serval. So two nights ago. This is a civet. I can, it's much stockier and smaller than a serval and is not in fact a true cat, but closest, closer to a mixture between a badger and a mongoose and a cat all thrown together, puts it in the family Viveridae. So more related to genets than to anything else. Also, all of those animals from the striped pole cats to the mongoose to the civet, and across to the genets, all have those anal glands and are capable of excreting quite a smelly paste from them. Now, Paul, you were asking about the civet. Civet, to me, is an animal that I've seen a bit more often than I have a serval. And in fact, there used to be one that lived in the camp where I was living. Now, when I brought my dog to the bush, she was seven weeks old and about that big coming through. It's not, a, it's not a fence camp where she lives at the moment and she's quite happy to move about with the different animals. But the civet was an interesting one because the civet really liked her dog food. And we've got the most amazing pictures of her growing up slowly but surely watching the civet eat out of her dog food bowl with a really perplexed expression on her face until all of a sudden she realized actually I'm the same size as this thing and decided what would be a really good idea would be to try and scare it away from her dog food, which she duly did. And the civet ran about 20 meters into the bush and then stopped, slammed on the brakes, turned around, fur up like this, and growled at her. I promise you, you have never seen a dog turn tail so fast in your life. She came running back to hide behind me. And after that, it took us a while. She did go through a stage where she still wanted to chase the civet, and it was a battle of wills for a long time, until it got to the point where she was actually much larger than the civet. She's quite a big dog. And we managed to actually train that tendency to chase it out of her. It was a tricky thing to do. She's a Weimaraner. 
So if something runs away from her, she wants to run after it, but she doesn't do it anymore. She also used to play with the baby and Yala in the garden. They were her first and favorite companions. I have, she does live with my friend. It doesn't seem as though she still plays with the Inyala. She's actually now got a much closer, much more related puppy dog friend. One of, the, one of our friends has got a German shorthead pointer puppy to keep her entertained and to keep each other busy. But definitely a day in the life of a bush dog. The first animal she ever saw was an elephant from the car. And she was actually too young to even register this giant shape looming above her. I had her up in my hands like this, trying to show her, so that she'd learn from an early age not to bark or be scared of them. And she sort of blinked wearily at it. And then after it had moved off, I put her down next to the pile of elephant dung that he had deposited to teach her or to give her an opportunity to smell it. And she promptly decided to bolt down about half of it. She was obviously feeling particularly hungry that morning and she tucked in, and that's a habit that she's had ever since. She loves the odd bite of elephant dung. A very healthy, happy dog. Oh goodness, Jandre. There comes a time. <laughs> this one's even bigger than the last one. Tennis ball sized dung ball. Now, the other morning, Jandre and myself stopped and spent, how long was it, about 45 minutes, longer, an hour? About an hour with a male dung beetle that was pushing the ball, started by pushing the ball along like this, and then proceeded to bury it. I don't think we shall attempt the same thing this morning, just because there are other things to find. But just watching this whole process is always hugely entertaining, and this dung beetle has been Excessively industrious this morning. Look how large that is compared to his body size. And there's the female. Every now and again, she makes a brief screen appearance as she clings desperately onto the side of this dung ball. She's done well. She's done well for herself. Female dung beetles not above choosing their mates for their resources. Connor, in final control, would like to know where is he taking the dung beetle? Um, where does he go with it? And these are the existential questions that plague our morning conversation. And the answer is, he's going to find somewhere appropriate to bury it. Somewhere with nice soft sand where he can dig underneath it and put it underground. Connor, how on earth they decide where they want to go how they, if they have a set destination in mind or if they just keep pushing until they find somewhere they think appropriate, I really honestly don't know. It's a question that I've often asked myself. Where is he going? He's definitely going somewhere. Look, there he has to pop onto the top to have a look. Now he's decided he, he's maybe veering a little bit too far to the east and he wants to go further west. Unfortunately, there are obstacles that lie ahead. There is a bolster in the road, so a, an incline that presents no trouble to you or I, but nevertheless might be something tricky for this poor dung beetle. Their strength is astounding, but Connor, how they make that decision, I wish I could tell you. I think he's aiming for the side of the road. He's going to find that this, is, this area is a relatively hard soil type. It's quite sandy, quite grainy. It's not soft like the one we watched the other morning. But yet he does, he does clearly have a destination in mind. Because every now and again he stands on the dung ball and looks which way he's going to go. Oh, he's done well though. He's missed the, he's missed the bolster. Here we go, up, have a quick look. Where am I, disoriented? Okay, that's the way I want to go. <laughs> All the while the female clinging on bravely, not seemingly too bothered when the dung ball rolls around on top of her. She's decided that he is her man and she's sticking with him, particularly since he has provided her with such a large dung ball in which to lay her eggs. 
She also serves another important purpose. If he loses control of that dung wall and it rolls away around her, or rolls down a hill, she'll be there to act almost like a stopper. So she stops it from being quite so round. And then if he does let go and it goes rolling off, she'll be able to stop it from going too far away. Oh, goodness. I would love to know where this dung ball is off to. I want to also have a look at the track. Lynn would like to know on that subject of where he's going and how he's making that decision. Lynn wants to know how far can a dung beetle roll a dung ball in a day? And Lynn, I followed one for at least a kilometer and a half. So just over three quarters of a mile. I'm just stopping here. I wanted to see if I could see where his tracks go, but they're not clearly visible at all. So, Lynn, I, I know for certain that they'll go at least three quarters of a mile or more, but I'm not sure exactly what the absolute maximum is for the distance that they will travel. Presumably, it must have an end point at some point. Where is he going? How has he decided that this way is the way to go? What is he looking for in an appropriate property? Has, did he scan the property annuals before deciding which way to go? Or is it just a spur of the moment search for an appropriate place? I'm not sure these are questions that actually have an answer to them. I know somebody fairly well whose father is probably the leading entomologist in South Africa and has spent a lot of time studying the movements of dung beetles. I think I'm going to get hold of him and ask him these questions because it's fascinating. Diana, this, the gentleman that I was talking about actually co-wrote a paper about the very question that you're asking. You're saying, do they navigate by the Milky Way? Because that's what you've heard. Now, he, this particular gentleman was actually awarded the Ig Nobel Prize for his research. The Ig Nobel Prize, of course, being a semi-serious prize, but just into branches of science and research that isn't necessarily what we would call, or what one would call, conventional. And it does seem as though there is very much a celestial, um, there's a celestial aspect to the navigation of dung beetles, whether it's the combination of the Milky Way or whether it is the moon. We'll have to, I'll have to double check and read that paper. I'm going to try and get hold of him and just ask whether he could give me a little bit more information on dung beetles, because he's definitely spent a considerable period of time, and actually a considerable period of time out here. One of the South African universities, a couple of them, but particularly in this area, the Johannesburg Witwatersrand University, has quite a few rural research stations in this area. And they do often send researchers out to the side. I'm not this morning, I don't think, going to stay without gentleman dung beetle and his dung ball. I don't know that we could survive following him for potentially three quarters or more of a mile. So we'll be moving on. Uh, I've said that he's been particularly industrious in the way in which he's rolled this ball. Montana Steve, you were wondering how did he find a dung ball that is so round? The answer is he didn't find it. He found a pile of dung and he made it himself using his forelimbs, patting it down, starting with a sort of tiny, tiny piece of dung and getting larger and larger and larger until he has produced a dung ball of a significant proportion to his body size. What is interesting, the only other aspect of that, is that he might not have made that dung ball. He might have watched another industrious dung beetle male make the dung ball and then kicked him off once that d male was t feeling a bit tired, kicked him off, stolen his dung ball and made off with the lady and the prize, or the lady being the prize and the dung ball, whatever which way you want to interpret that. He could have been a very industrious hard worker. He could also have been a very canny thief. We just don't know. He's on his way. I think he's found a nice soft, wet patch of soil in which to dig. We're going to carry on and see what other wonders we can find you. In the meantime, let's find out how Brent's morning's going. So we haven't found any fresh tracks yet, so what I'm doing is what you do when you can't 
find any tracks, you go back to the last track. So I'm starting at the top of the Viatella access road and just checking to exactly where those tracks were seen. Now, when you see stuff like that in the road, it is almost always where predators had a snooze. In this case, it is a hyena, but he had decided to have a pit stop on the road and a little lie about. Now, with lions, it's obviously, they roll around a bit more, so it's generally quite spread out across the road. Leopard will make a very similar track to that where they've lied, uh, where they've lain down. Of course, no hyena claws there, but uh, it'll be leopard pads. So Lucy, who's in South Bend, Indiana, would like to know, would monkeys alarm called hyena? Uh, not generally, Lucy. Hyena are not really good at climbing trees. They can't really snack on them out there. So they don't normally ha uh, alarm call at hyena. They might accidentally alarm call at a serval or something like that that looks like a potential predator to them, even though it's not. Generally, those alarm calls will be reserved uh, for the big cats and for... So I just thought I heard something. And for the big eagles, like martial eagles and crowned eagles. So I think we're going to have an explosion of flies today once it heats up a bit. Sorry, guys, just be on the radio. Morning tax uh, is in Konzo of Wanuna Ingwe on Viatela Access, uh, just before the junction of uh, Galago Shortcut. Zoe's, I uh, can't see where he goes. It was quite dark. I'm heading back in that area. Uh, apparently, there were Nkau alarming much earlier around Viatela, but I can't find any in Konzo. And I think that's it for the morning so far. I'll try to check the uh, Viatella main access towards uh, Obrus Road that side. Kobe, thanks. Also, update from yours. Uh, after drive last night, you had Mvula on Viatella main access. I'm not exactly sure where, so I'm just double checking now. There we go. It looks like Tax is going to come and help, help, help us in the area. Good morning. How are you? Thank you. Uh, nice to look for tracks on the road like this. Sorry, guys, just listen. Okay, copy that. Thank you very much. We'll go and check that side. So Daryl's wondering, are there any large uh, We will come back to that question now, but uh, let's jump on to Jamie, who's got an avian predator. Well, this is such a beautiful scene. Our two beloved pale Wahlberg's eagles sitting, bonding and grooming each other. And in the next few weeks, in the next few months, they will be bulking up for their journey back into North Africa. Isn't it incredible that a migratory bird species like this is capable of maintaining a bond with their mate as strongly as they do, and able to return each year to breed with exactly the same bird? And it's moments like this that really do reinforce the bonds between them. The male on the left, from what I can see, grooming the female on the right. 
including all of those hard to reach mites and ticks around the beak and face. They really are truly attractive birds. About 10, about 10 percent of the population of Warburg's eagles are this pale creamy color, so relatively unusual and lovely to see a male and a female of that particular kind together. Genetics wise it is a recessive gene so both parents carry it. But most of their offspring in this case will be, in fact all of their offspring in this case will be probably be pale morph forms. She's now returning the favor. Keep cleaning around his cheeks and around his eyes and neck. Now I said that the fee it looks like the female on the right, and the reason that I've <coughs> said that. You okay there, Jandre? Did you swallow a fly by any chance? There are lots of flies buzzing about. Poor Jandre has begun puce from trying not to cough. <laughs> Shame. Um, there are lots of flies about. I was going to say that the female is in all raptor species larger than the male. We've spoken before about the different theories as to why that may be. One of them is that her maternal instincts are stronger than his paternal instincts. So there might be time where his hunting instinct is triggered by his, the movements and squeals of his own chicks, and therefore she has to be large enough to defend them from him. And you can take from that theory what you will. I'm not sure if I buy it or whether I don't. Do you want some water, Jandre? <laughs> Would you like some? Oh, you've got some. It's sorted out. I know exactly what that feels like. There's nothing like breathing in a fly. Dave's had to remove flies from the eyes of, we are going down the Dr. Zeus route there, but flies from the eyes of both James and myself. He's actually proved to be very good at it. He was very gentle when he pulled the flies out of my eyes. And it is just one of the aspects of having, now this, this season has not been bad at all, but one of the aspects of having a little bit of raid is that the flies are swarming, the insects are out, and driving about at night with your lights on becomes an experience that could potentially be hazardous to one's health, with dung beetles flying around and attempting to navigate themselves right into your face. One last look at our beautiful eagles, just because this shot is so stunning in this morning light. Well, the Warburg's eagle is a fairly common migratory bird, but Clayton was wondering on a sort of larger spectrum, what is the most common bird in, to see in the Kruger Park? Clayton, I can't think necessarily of a specific species, although red-billed quelia, which is the most numerous bird species in Africa, is one that does regularly fly through the Kruger National Park. You will see a lot of hornbills, yellow-billed and red-billed hornbills, grey go-away birds, starlings, barbets. I'm trying to think what the absolute most common, there's lots and lots and lots of white-fronted bee-eaters, swallows. In terms of numbers though, it's probably the red-billed quelia, a tiny little, quite cryptically coloured bird, doesn't have bright, flashy colours. Nevertheless, that's probably one of your most common to see. And again, it depends on the area. Bear in mind, of course, that Kruger is absolutely so enormous that it carries a number of different ecosystems within it. And thus, you could see plenty of different birds. Some bird species might be more common in, other er in certain areas than others. But across it, the ubiquitous yellow-billed hornbill is everywhere, from top to bottom as are the white-fronted bee-eaters, the go-away birds, and so on and so forth. Oh, Kruger's a wonderful place, by the way, to go birding. 
that because, specifically because of the diversity of habitat, I've just stopped to have a look quickly while I'm here at the mushroom on my right. And the fact that it's been munched by something. Now, originally I had absolutely no idea that Speaks hinged tortoises ate mushrooms. It was James who educated me in that particular respect. And subsequent to that, I went past and saw my Speaks hinge tortoise that I've seen very regularly on quarantine. And I know it's the same one because he's got a big scar across the back of his shell. But I found my Speaks hinge tortoise mating with a much larger female. And all she was interested in was eating that specific type of mushroom. So I'm going to do a bit more research into finding out exactly what type that is. It's so interesting. The more we see, the more we learn. The more we are out here, the more we observe. And speaking of observing things, let's head over to the ever-observant Brent, see if he's managed to find more tracks for us. So we're back into the last area where we saw those tracks. And Daryl, back to your question about whether there are any advantageous or disadvantageous situations that arise for animals out here. Now, Daryl, that's quite a, a difficult question to answer. I mean, it, it, it changes on a daily basis. A zebra stepping into a hole could be advantageous for the zebra, but very dis... I mean, for the lions, but very disadvantageous for the zebra. So it, it all depends. Uh, droughts, very good for, for the predators, specifically lion and hyena, and leopard, uh, where there's heavy rains, lots of green grass, is more advantageous for the prey species. They go into the, go into the dry season in a lot better condition. Uh, this year is going to be quite interesting. I think this, this year is going to definitely be a predator year. Uh, even though we have had this late rain and the dams have some water in them, it's not nearly as much as we would normally have at this time of year. So I think it's going to be a tough, tough dry season for the herbivores. Just trying to see where, I, where did I spot that leopard track? It was a bit further down, Dave. There we go. I think it was here somewhere on Dave's side. I think it might have been a bit further up. I am going to check the Zoe's, I think. Could have been around here where we saw that track. Can you look there, Dave? It's on your side. Okay. No. There have been a few vehicles already this morning, but we did see them in this area. Just double check now that it's light, all these road junctions. Just hyenas. I'm going to check for one last road junction. The problem is there's been a big herd of elephants through here overnight, which have covered up quite a few of the tracks. Hmm. So the last track was going here. And the last report from yours is that he went west. Hyenas, hyenas, hyenas. So let's check to the southwest along Zoe's Road and see what we can find there. Now, this is the road where Jamie had that fantastic serval sighting last night. Rolf in Michigan is wondering which cats have very distinctive markings on their back of their ears. He says their bobcats have very distinctive white markings. Well, Rolf, all our cats have very distinctive markings on the back of their ears. And depending on the species, they have different colors. Lions and uh, black, leopard black, serval black, caracal also black. I think they're all black, to be honest. Um, and 
the reason for this is it is a following mechanism for, for cubs and it will probably be exactly the same for the bobcats. Now, in a social cat, the only social cat, which is lions, they have a slightly more uh, impressive role. And uh, there's quite an interesting study being conducted by the University of Miami at the moment, and a couple of friends of mine are, are doing that study on visible cues uh, during hunts in social predators, specifically lions and wild dogs. And uh, watching, I, th I believe after watching lions as long as I have, that the other lions are watching during the hunt. So they're having non-verbal communication. And I think a lot of it's to do with the, the black tip of the tail and also the movement of the ears. And so with lions, I do believe the ears play quite an important part in the hunt. It'll be very interesting to see when that study is going to be done. It'll still be a couple of years before they've gathered all the information. Spotted Aussie, and of course, being a spotted Aussie, must be in Australia. Uh, spotted Aussie is wondering why do caracal have those long tufts on their ear? Uh, again, that could be for the cubs and stuff to follow. It also will help with their hearing a bit and bring their hearing in a little bit. And also, it, it could be for, for, for mating the male with the Longest tufts might look the best, might have the best genetics. So it could be a way for females to choose a mate. But I think there's a couple of other animal species, uh, cats that have those long tufts, the lynx, also does, and also another small cat. No sign of tracks yet. So, oh, yeah, hang on. As I said, that it's a hyena track. So there's a nice big game path that goes through here, and I'm hoping those tracks come out on. Shell in New Jersey saying, you don't get any links there, right? Or have I lost my mind? Uh, we don't. Shall we get caracal, which is sometimes incorrectly called a lynx. Uh, it is one of the common names. Well, not incorrectly called, but uh, a little bit confusing. Uh, caracal is called, sometimes called a lynx. Hello, old men. Some old buffalo bulls. Oh, a bit jumpy this morning. Oh, there's another one sleeping behind the, the bush right next to the road. Hello, big boy. Yes, you're very scary. Fight that branch. There you go. Retired gentleman. Oh, you see all those flies buzz off him. So these guys, definitely now that it's a bit cooler, they will spend their days around pans, but in the evenings they'll move up onto the crests like this. It's slightly warmer higher here, because of course warm air rises, so they can stay warmer for a little bit longer. Big boys. And so it's very obvious that if these guys, I'm pretty sure these guys have been sleeping here since probably about 7.30 last night, or even maybe a bit earlier. So if the leopard had come this way, he would have avoided these cantankerous old buffalo. Bye-bye, big boys. Oh, 
Apparently, I have an insect friend on the back of my cap. I can't see what it is. You just lean forward a bit. Oh, look at that. It is a rubber fly with an incredibly long pr proboscis. I mean, I don't want to take my cat cap off, he might fly. Now, you see that really long nose of his? That is a specially designed mouth part uh, to sink into flowers to get the nectar. So certain robber flies are predatory, others are... I, I, apparently, Steph, who's watching Final Control, says it's a bee fly. So look at that. Isn't that incredible? I'm going to, now that you've had a good look, I'm going to try to take them off so I can have a proper look. Oh, darn it. I was going to try to put him on the dash, but he's disappeared. So that long mouth part that you saw there, the proboscis, was especially designed to sink into or go, get into flowers uh, to extract nectar. Well, here we go. Wildlife's coming to me. Now, hopefully the leopards will do the same. It is a beautiful morning. Very crisp light and a very crisp morning. So while we continue to check for the elusive leopard, uh, let's jump on with Jamie and see what she's up to. Daisy. Seems as though I've managed to unplug myself somewhere along the way. Jandre has just been very busy trying to get Buffalo Thorn out of the way. Thank you, Jandre, by the way, for that message. <laughs> Getting caught out every now and again. Jandre was trying to pull a Buffalo Thorn out of the road. I've been looking in the vehicle to see if I couldn't find a panga to help us out. And at the same time, trying to listen to my Game Drive channel to hear if there's any updates on those wild dogs that were heading across in this direction. I wondered why everything had gone so quiet. And Ellen, yes, going back to our lovely sighting of the Wahlberg's eagles, Yes, they are indeed monogamous, and they're monogamous in a way that not all bird species are. So 90-odd percent of birds are monogamous in the breeding season. But raptors in particular are monogamous, most of them, for the duration of their lifespan. And for larger eagles, that can be well over 20-odd years. And they've got a long time that they spend together. Those bonds that are formed last for the duration of at least one of their lives. The same goes, it's, un, it's a relatively unusual thing, in the, unusual thing in the animal kingdom, but the same goes for certain species of mammals as well. So, for example, jackal are generally monogamous, as are some of the small ant species, like snakes and steenbok. They will also mate for life. It's quite an interesting, an interesting example of the way in which animals choose or have to behave in certain ways socially. For the large cats, it's more appropriate for them to have as many males. There's much fresh genetics flowing through that. Here 
we go. We went through a little bit of a dip there. Oh, my goodness. This is one of the reasons why driving Hyena Road becomes an interesting thing. We've spoken about this particular puddle in the road before. It's the start of a pan. The animals are going to spend more and more time, or they would have if the rain was going to continue, more time wallowing there. And that essentially, unless it is blocked up, by, if, unless management decides to put sort of big thorn trees or something in its way, that will essentially be the end of the road there as we know it. In the same way that that's happened around the Vubu Road, we stopped and we looked at where the elephants had spent a considerable amount of time wandering out. Seems as though, just looking at the tracks as we go past, as though the buffalo are responsible for that large muddy wallow. I know that Brent chatted a lot a bit about the various leopards. This particular road seems to be Mvula and Gajima's, one of their favorite haunts, which is why we're checking along here. Leopards have seemed to be leading us on a merry dance over the last And I just spotted one of our chatting about, right at the back there now. Oh, running away. The common or the gray dacre. Another one of our example of monogamous in that they live together in little territories that they fiercely defend against members of the same sex. So the males will defend males, females against females. They do that is because although they are monogamous, they stick with the female with her offspring. Which is why I keep starting and then failing mid sentence and then carrying on again. What I was chatting a bit about the steering wheel, although they're monogamous and that they live there for their duration of lives, that does not automatically mean they are comfortable to their partner. Are working? Let's go over to. So we're circling the area. So you all said the tracks went head we headed west, so we're doing a big loop around past Impala Plains. And uh, not much on the plains this morning. And not many tracks j yet. But it is still a very early on on the Sunrise Safari, so anything could happen. Very, very beautiful morning and we're going very very slowly making sure we don't miss anything Ranger is spot on. Uh, we do like it when they drag the roads. It does make tracks much easier to find. Although the tracks are being quite scarce this morning. So well done to Lucy in Indiana, who's hit 200 on the Juma Live Safari bird list. 
Well done, Lucy. And it was the little sparrow hawk or shikra that we saw on yesterday's sunrise safari that took her to 200. Well, it seems like the hyenas have walked every road in Juma last night so far. Every road I've been on, there's a fresh set, fresh set of hyena tracks. Now they're capable of covering vast distance in their search for food. And their design enables them incredible stamina with that sloping back. So if I get no further luck with tracks in this area, I'm gonna head off to the northeastern corner and really sniffing at, at, at fumes there, but probably about three kilometers from there on yesterday's sunset safari, the guys found wild dogs and they were crossing to and from the Kruger National Park. But fingers crossed, they decided to beetle back to the northwest, which would bring them onto Juma. And if we don't, yeah, as I said, if we don't have any more luck with these leopard tracks, I'm gonna head into that area. Megan's wondering, is a wild dog more comparable to a wolf or a coyote? Well, Megan, to be honest, I'm gonna say neither. Uh, it is, it's separated from the canis, which uh, wolf and coyote both belong to the dog family canis. Uh, and it's its own, it's its own family, which is lichen, uh, which <laughs> strangely enough, in French means wolf, but it is a, uh, or licon, but it is not. So they've actually got an extra toe and uh, they have slightly different dentition. So a wolf and a coyote will have very similar dentition to a domestic dog, whereas wild dogs have very different uh, teeth, designed more for ripping. So uh, very interesting, but they, they split from, from the other dogs probably over a million years ago. Now, there obviously have been quite a few different versions of wild dogs on the evolutionary uh, tree and with only this one making it through. So they're about the size of a large domestic dog, but obviously a lot, a lot more finely built. They're not nearly as robust. So about the size of a large German Shepherd uh, or Doberman, but they're not as big and as heavy as those dogs. And they have built in for incredible stamina and speed, I mean, they can do up to 60 kilometers an hour for four or five kilometers. So incredible animals and uh, very exciting to watch. Anita in New Jersey, welcome Anita, uh, is saying with these strange changes in the weather patterns, do I think the rain is going to last a little bit longer? I don't, Anita. I actually, I actually, especially just feeling the air this morning, I could be completely wrong, but I think the rain is done for the, till the end of the year. I think we've had about all the rain we're going to have in terms of major rain. We might get the odd drizzly morning but I don't think we're gonna get any more serious rain. And as in terms of strange weather patterns, well, there's only one constant in the history of the Earth, and that is a change. So, as a, the draft was quite bad, but the last time we had El Nino, it was very, very similar. It lasted towards the end of the rainy season. We got good rains at the end of, end of the rainy season um, with a huge lack of rains during our traditional good rain period. So not so much strange as uh, different. And you've got to remember that weather patterns everywhere in the world work on cycles. 
and you have wet cycles and dry cycles and we've had a very wet last 10 years and I think we are going into a, a relatively dry in comparison uh, next sort of eight to ten years and that is normal normal that wet and dry cycles I'm not necessarily saying it's going to be drought for the next ten years I just don't think it's going to be as wet as it was the last ten years So while we continue to check this area uh, around where Mvula was seen last night, but he could be anywhere by now. We haven't unfortunately picked up any fresh tracks from this morning, but let's go see if Jamie's having a little bit more success than we are. Now, since Mvula could be anywhere, I've decided to start checking. Plenty of fresh elephant activity here. Uh, he could well be in this vicinity, or they could well be in this vicinity. In the middle of discussing. It seems like Jamie's got some gremlins. Uh, you're back with us in search for Nvula. Just going very slowly. The last tracks we saw were probably about 400 meters from, from us here. And I'm just going very slowly trying to see if I can pick up on a track crossing this little track that runs under the power lines. And you can see there's a huge amount of spider webs catching on the, the virtual reality rig and, and, and on our radio aerial this morning. And obviously these, a lot of these would have been spun during the night across the roads. And one of my favorite spiders is a completely nocturnal. It's called a bark spider. And during the day, it looks exactly like a little piece of bark and will sit up against a tree but then at night, it'll come out and it'll spin this impressive web uh, over a, an open area that it feels is a good chance at catching some insects. And then before sunrise, it eats its own web. So it doesn't want to lose all those proteins, because remember, spider webs are a protein, so it takes quite a lot of effort for the spiders to build the webs. So it doesn't want to lose all that protein, so it'll re-eat its web. Uh, before sunrise and then go spend its day looking like a piece of bark to avoid being eaten. Another little interesting spider that has quite a similar strategy, except it doesn't look like bark, it looks like a bird dropping, and it is aptly named the bird dropping spider. So a little white tip on it, and it's got quite a conical back, and it'll sit on a branch and stuff and look like a bird dropping. Now, we have seen bark spiders, or I have seen bark spiders, and I think we have shown them on the live drives and one of the night drives, but I don't think we've maybe managed to find a bird dropping spider yet. Daryl is wondering, are there any plants attracting bees at the moment? And yes, there are, Daryl, quite a few after a nice little bit of rain we had. And here is a, a, quite an interesting one. Well, this one doesn't have a bee, it's got a fly on it. Um, I, mean, I think it's one of these. Is the fly flying off? No, the one that come out to get, there he is, there. So there we go, there's a fly species um, getting in that pollen. Now here we have, there's a couple of flies there. And you can see the fly in the front, front one actually collecting yeah, pollen there. Uh, 
Look at that. So this is a sickle bush, or sometimes referred to as a Chinese lantern tree. And quite a few different fly species get there. Ooh. So it's not only bees that pollinate out here in the bush. We've got lots of wasps, flies, moths, butterflies. So a whole host of different species that aid in pollination. Now, if we have a careful look at this sickle bush, or as its nickname, the Chinese lantern tree, with those very pretty little flowers. So you will see some of the flowers are pink and some of them are white. Now, quite a lot of insects can see in color. And basically, the pink flowers have not yet been pollinated, and the white flowers have. So isn't that fascinating? So those are, the white ones have already been pollinated, the pink ones haven't just yet. So you'll find the bees and butterflies and flies and other things fo focusing their attentions on the pink ones. And I can't actually see anything on a white one. Okay, well, there we go, Dal. There we go. There's lots of different flowers around at the moment. Um, and I am really hoping with this last little bit of rain that we've had that one of my favorite flowers that's on a tree, whoa, there's a hole there I didn't see, whoops, um, will start flowering. And that is the gardenias. They have absolutely stunning big white and yellow flowers, but it's the scent that emanates from them that is just so splendid. So we will be checking some of the big gardenias around, hoping for a late bloom, because they haven't flowered yet this year, and it's one of the more prominent flowering trees that we see. I thought for a second I heard monkey alarm call. Let's do one last check uh, down past the lodges. It was sort of just in the distance and sort of and I wasn't, I'm not 100% sure if it was a monkey or I misheard over the vehicle, but let's go have one last check in that area. Lucy in Indiana, thanks for yet another question. Uh, Lucy would like to know how long will the grass stay green for if we don't get any more rain? Uh, difficult to be exact, Lucy, but probably a month or so, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit less. Uh, we're going to have to keep an eye on it to see how long it, it stays green for. But although. Quickly, Dave, quickly, quickly. Right on the edge of the road there. And one of the hardest little birds to get on the cameras. Little blue waxbill, a very common species here. But very, very difficult because they're so small and they fly off really quickly. And that little seed eater, you can actually see them picking uh, the grass seeds off the stalk there. Uh, I do apologize about the slight heat haze um, in front of the bird that is coming off the engine. Uh, but unfortunately, I think if I move anywhere, He's going to fly off, but look at that. Isn't that incredible? There we go, Lucy, one of the species that's very happy with the fact that there's been some grass growth. Oh, there's another one. Look at it. Look at it. Taking those grass seeds. It's spectacular. I think this is the best blue wax ball sighting I've ever had on the live drives. see which grass species they're feeding off, but it's a little bit difficult from this length. But it does look like possibly 
Oh, my glasses are a bit rusty. I'm going to have to have a pick of that grass and have a closer look once these guys are finished. Maybe there's one closer to us. Let's see. There we go. Look at that. So they'll feed off a whole host of little grass seeds. Now, they are able to feed off them once they dry as well. But, of course, they will have expected or been used to a very wet summer with lots of fresh grass seeds, but they will be able to take advantage of them for a, bit, a little bit longer. And even when an animal like a buffalo or zebra comes and feeds on that grass, and those little seeds will drop to the ground, and these little guys will be able to find them. Not only the best blue wax ball sighting I've had, also the longest. Now, how would you describe that color blue, Dev? I would almost say powder puff blue. Now, they've got very interesting nesting habits. So, when they want to build a nest, they'll actively look for a, a paper wasp or one of the paper wasp species that build those sort of round or not quite round but they've got lots of cylinders where they lay their eggs and there'll be multiple wasps that look after those nests so they will build their their little nest almost right next to or on top of the wasp nest as an extra form of defense look at that it's got to stretch up to grab those seeds and there we go. You see it also, a couple of seeds fall off when they do that, so they'll pick the ones up off the ground as well. Very, very cute. Nom, 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 nom. And you can see there how that top section of that grass has been stripped by the wax ball. <laughs> Look at that, jumping on the stalk to bring it down to a good feeding height. And we'll see how much of that grass stalk is left when he moves off. See how many seeds have been stripped. Obviously now, this is good for the grass as it's good for the wax ball. That wax ball will move off and defecate and deposit those seeds with a bit of fertilizer somewhere else so they might spot next year in the next set of rains. Or end of this year in the next set of rains. So, welcome to Dylan in New York, a new viewer. Uh, welcome to the Safari Live family, Dylan. Uh, Dylan is wondering, what is the name of that leopard we've been looking for this morning? Well, Dylan, the name of the leopard is Mvula, which means the rain. So, Mvula is his name, M-V-U-L-A. So, it looks like this wax ball's nearly done with his grass stalk. And he's going to jump off it. Let's see how much is left. Oh, eaten about 50%. So let's leave the wax bowl to his breakfast and go see what's happening at the Bufflesook waterhole with Jamie. Uh, it seems as though our signal is a little bit more stable on the southern side of the dam. Uh, we're able to just chat a little bit about what a Bufflesook is looking like and, of course, the current resident of Buffalo's Hook Dam in the form of this hippopotamus. Quite difficult to tell. I'm fairly certain that it's a male, just judging by the size and the shape of the head. They tend to have slightly more angular faces 
than the females. And he does look like quite a large individual, so it could be Bob the Bachelor of Buffleshook. Could be another hippo that's decided to come in and spend the day here after a long night of foraging. Could even be the one that you guys saw at the Juma Dam last night, or heard at the Juma Dam last night, wandering through. I've seen his tracks walking all the way along Twin Dams. But it could well be this individual. And even now, his body language tells me that he's not fully comfortable in this dam. And I think it's because it's not deep enough to fully submerge him. When we drove up, he gave us a sort of backwards glance as if to say, please don't come any closer. And it's interesting the way that hippo behavior has changed over the last few weeks. There's also an Egyptian goose that is currently patrolling the edges of the dam, looking for any plant matter to consume. This was one of the tracks that caught me out with Renius. He spoke before about Darlene's question as to whether or not you can identify individual bird species by their tracks. This is one that caught me out, the Egyptian goose. I didn't look closely enough to see the webbing in between the toes and the mud around the Boyatella Dam. Alona, probably recently reached adulthood and is out looking for a mate. Very sociable birds, though. I think my record was about 25 or so of them around Arethusa Dam. So it's very common to see more than one. Less common to see one all on his own. Doesn't seem too bothered, though. Sifting through the water to pick up the algae and anything else that might be growing around there. And already Buffles Hook Dam water levels starting to drop. It's fairly clear around the edges of the dam where the water reached and how much it has gone down. Morning, Franklin. Having a long extended conversation with their members opposite this side of the dam. If we can just have a look, Chandra, at the water's edge closer here. I'm looking here. Sorry. You can just see how much the water levels have gone down. Some of that might have splashed up a bit when the hippo walked in. But you can see all of the wet mud along the edges. And that just shows how clearly and how rapidly the sun can act out here. Because although there is a nip to the air, and it'll, we have sort of entered autumn, if we could call it that, the sun is still baking hot enough to start reducing the water levels very rapidly. This, of course, being one of Mvula's favorite spots, which is one of the reasons why we are here. No leopard tracks coming through here, though. There's more of a guess than anything else, and just one that hasn't yet paid off. Let's see if my cheeky Franklin are going to carry on squawking. They're just ahead of me here, so I'll move forward and see if they're gonna keep continue their conversation. in between the grass. So no tracks and uh, I can't hear any monkey alarm calls, so let's go check in a different section. And Jamie's in the northeast and uh, there seem to be gremlins there, so I don't want to infect my vehicle. So we're going to head to the southwest, see if we can find anything in that area. who's a regular and 18 years old in Ohio, says she hasn't been able to watch in a few days. Have there any, any updates on the Inkahuma Pride? Well, Sarah, the Inkahuma Pride have done a disappearing act. We actually haven't seen tracks or heard anything about them in about four or five days now, but hopefully they will be turning up shortly. Uh, last tracks I had headed into Arethusa 
So maybe they've gone west out of Arethusa, but I haven't had any updates from the guys in the west. But maybe as I move towards the west and my radio comms get better, I'll have a, have a check, give them a call on the radio, see if there are any further updates there. It's going to be an absolutely gorgeous day. There's barely a cloud in the sky. Just some very high, wispy, ultra, ultra strat, ultra stratus, if I remember my clouds correctly. You can barely make them out. But let's have a look here. There's hyena tracks for a change. And let's have a look what these ones are on this side. And it is more hyena tracks. I'm just trying to make sure that there's not a leopard track underneath them. But nope. Doesn't look like it. And it is such a beautiful morning, and the light is spectacular. And I think let's put you guys to the test since you're so quiet this morning. Let's uh, find something to get your brains in gear. Although I think it's evening for a lot of our viewers. So give you a brain teaser before bed. Let's start with a nice easy one. I know certain of our viewers are like looking at trees as much as animals. So let's start with this tree over here. Nice tree, one of the more prominent species we see regularly out here in the Saabi Sands. It is at certain times of the year heavily favored by the pachyderms, in particular elephants, as well as a lot of other different species. So who can tell me what tree that is? And bonus points if you can get its scientific name. What tree is that? And uh, we're going to give you two trees, because that one's so easy. But let me give you a little hint. They are slightly collected, not in family, but in common name. So we've got another one on the other side here. In some ways, they might look a little similar. But if we zoom in on the bark of this one, you can see the bark slightly different. And so are the leaves. And there we go. We'll give you one little pan up of this tree. And another one of the tree we just showed you. Can't say I'm not giving you enough chance to have a proper look. So who can tell me what are these two tree species? If you know the answer, or if you think you know the answer, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. Well, Monkey Man is guessing, and it's definitely very much a guess. He says a buffalo thorn. Uh, well, the one thing I can tell you, neither of those two tree species have any thorns. or spines for that matter, so no thorns or modified branches to be sharp, nasty spikes. Right, let's have a look. There is a buffalo thorn there. This particular one's been pushed down by an elephant, but you can see the leaves, that one there, are very, very small and very, very shiny, which neither of those are particularly as shiny as that. And there's a fallen buffalo thorn. And then last night on the Sunset Safari, you got a question about the biggest uh, fruit that we find out here. And that tree there is the culprit, the Kigilia africana, the African sausage tree. 
the largest fruit measuring over 1.2 meters long and weighing nine, over nine kilograms, if my memory serves me correctly. So there we go. Just not many of them. I think there's only two on Juma. They prefer areas around big rivers, so around the Sabi and Sand River, there are some massive specimens. Yeah, we've only got two quite small ones, unfortunately. we've got an answer through is that a lead tree no it is not a lead wood oh, the sun's in my way there sorry oh what was that it's still there let me just try see if we can get dave in the, the right position he's still there by the time we turn around nope flown off. That's unfortunate. We'll keep looking for another one. It was a little chin spot battis, very pretty little flycatcher. So well done to Donovan, Lynn, James, Richard, and many others who got the first tree right. So we're still waiting for the second tree. It is a marula tree, and James Richard is the only one to get the Latin for the bonus points, Sclerocaria buria. So we're still waiting for the answer for the second tree. Well done to Raisa, who got the second tree right. It is a false marula, Lania Schwein fur the eye. Or Schwein fur the eye, there's a lot of different ways to pronounce it. But well done, Raisa, spot on. So quite nice, it's not often you can sit in one spot and see a real marula and a false marula. So it was the perfect spot to start the tree quits. Okay, so while we continue to check the south and western sectors of Juma Private Game Reserve, uh, Jamie has actually found an animal that possesses a heartbeat. Unlike our trees, though alive, their heart doesn't beat. Let's just sit very quietly for a moment and take my earpiece out. The reason these kudu are so skittish is because there are other kudu or nyala barking frantically off to the west of us. I'm just going to get hold of Brent. Brent for Jamie. Brent, there's alarm calls along Central Road. Sounds like Nyala Road Junction. I'm going to follow up from the eastern side. Copy. OK, time for us to go. These kudu, I know that they are beautiful, but they are very much hidden in the thick bush. And they're very, very skittish. And they're skittish because there are others alarm calling off to the west of us. 
And we were just, Jandre and myself, were just saying as they came towards us that they were unusually skittish. I'm trying to gauge exactly where those alarm calls were coming from. It's one of those tricky things to do when they are at a distance is to figure out exactly how far and roughly where one should start searching for the culprit of causing the alarm in the kudu or the inyala. Now, kudu and inyala and bushbuck to an extent have the deepest alarm calls of all the antelope. Kudu having the loudest and the deepest. It's a deep bah sound. And the deeper, the deep frequency, of course, allows it to travel further when moving through thick bush areas. And from my, what I could calculate, they're exactly along the road that I wanted to go up but didn't want to risk it in case our signal disappeared. But I'm pretty sure that whatever animal is causing that alarm is starting to move towards Inyala Road North. Everybody keep your eyes peeled. It's amazing because we know, both Brent and myself know, that there is a leopard somewhere that's been moving around Wuyatela Dam and now moving further to the west. And yet finding it has not always proved to be the easiest exercise. It's definitely here somewhere though. It's, it's either lions or it's leopard that it causes those sorts of alarm calls from a kudu or a nyala. Sarah, I know that you were asking about the Nkuhumas, and I'm not sure if Brent picked up on the answer to your question or not after I disappeared off your screens. I know that Brent updated you, but we still never found tracks of the Nkuhumas crossing out of Juma, so that it could be them as well that's causing the alarm in the various antelope species. I'm going to try and find a nice position to show you something else and gives me a chance to listen out as well. Standing by. Brent, I actually think maybe even a little way north up in Yarra Road North. It's right into the sun. There are two vultures hanging out in the dead tree. And I just want to stop and listen again. I'm going to be taking my earpiece out for the moment. The Franklins are calling, but it's not really an alarm call sound. It's more just their morning communication to each other. Kudu have gone quiet. They generally only bark if they're, when they can see the threat and to alert everything, and then they go quiet once again. They prefer secrecy to a large extent. So we have two white-backed vultures that are roosting in the dead tree. That's fairly common. I don't think that means that they are settling, watching some kind of kill in progress. We've spoken a lot about the different vulture behavior and the fact that they like to roost at night in dead trees and wait for the morning to warm up so that they can jump on board with the thermals. It's only when you see them starting to fly down out of the sky, when you've got multiple vulture species moving about together, and when you see them roosting in trees with leaves, that you start to suspect that there might be something there worth investigating. And that's just because as big bulky birds, and not necessarily the best flyers in the world, the heavy birds, getting out of a marula tree with lots of, with lots of leaves or a jackalberry tree with lots of vegetation around them is something that they prefer to avoid unless it means a meal or a chance to wait patiently for a meal. Vultures about, but I think just here to spend the night and wait for the thermals to start getting warm enough. And speaking about vultures, 
Siberia Zumi would like to know whether I've ever seen a bearded vulture. And the answer is Siberia Zumi. I haven't. It's a relatively rare find. Exceptionally rare find out here. I have seen an Egyptian vulture once, which was, there was a great deal of excitement within the Kruger Park. People came from miles around, and I mean quite literally miles around. Certain birders actually jumped on planes to go and see the Egyptian vulture that decided to pay the Kruger Park a visit. Sorry, and I'm just concentrating very hard on in checking. It's amazing the lengths at which birders will go to in order to be able to follow up on the presence of unusual bird species in an area. I just have a, want to have a look at the body language of this grey go away bird. In a funny position that it's adopted. They're also, of course, one of our first ports of call when it comes to alarm calls. With their height up there, mm -hmm. one of the first to spot any kind of threat. We're coming close to the junction where I think that the alarm calls came from, but I still don't think we're far enough north, and I don't think that I can go further north without risking losing my signal. Luckily, Brent is on his way, so he will be able to check the area for us. Oh, I wasn't wanting an opportunity to just stop and listen and observe, but I also wanted to answer Siberia Zumi's question more fully about the bearded vulture, and possibly even show you a question whilst I, oh, show you a question? That doesn't even, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. It's what happens when you try to split your brain in too many directions at once. I wanted to show you a picture of what a bearded vulture or a lamachaya looks like. It is a bearded vulture, and yes, you are right about their rocky mountainous areas and cliff ledges, Siberia Zumi. And they're very much uncommon in South Africa. They only have a tiny, tiny range around the Drakensberg Mountains. I have been looking for them in the Drakensberg Mountains before, but I only managed to find a colony of Cape vultures, which was fairly exciting, but nevertheless not something that I managed to locate. There's also the palm nut vulture, which is another bird that every now and again makes an appearance in South Africa. Ah, it's another one on my list of birds to see. And another one that if it appears, people will be jumping on planes in order to come and find them. I think that might have been Brent that I could hear accelerating. Somehow I feel as though that might have been him zooming past this junction. Let's find out what he's up to and which way he's going. So we've moved into the same area as Jamie. I just stopped and listened now. I couldn't hear any alarms. Um, but I'm going to go on Hyena Road, which runs parallel to Inyala Road North, where Jamie's checking. So fingers crossed. Okay, so often we have leopards in that block between Buffalshook Dam, Central Road, between the two uh, roads, or well, the roads, Hyena Road and Nyala Road North. So I'm going to check through here in case whatever was being alarmed at decided to come this way. Unfortunately, this is a very difficult road to see tracks on, so we're going to have to rely a lot on our ears. Jamie, Jamie. Uh, Jamie, confirm what species was alarming? It was either a or kudu, I think more likely in Yala. Uh, copy, thanks. I'll check Hyena Road through to the fire break. Okay, so we're going to go for a little bit, then we're going to switch off and listen again. I can hear a very upset rattling okay, testicular. I'm fairly out of check to the other road. 
negative. I haven't done y'all in all. So uh, what we are hoping, because there's a lot of dew around at the moment, a lot of your predators, lion and leopard, will often choose to walk down a road or okay, a large go animal path. Check. I don't think I'll have to take a look. Just to see. And so they don't get you on their face. Slightly uncomfortable, and the, the big cats would prefer to stay a little dry. further down. Oh dear, it looks like the elephant and buffalo have made a new wallow in the middle of the road. And we'll go around that. I wonder if those are the ones alarming. So there they are, the Nyala. So they've come out of this block. But there could be multiple Nyala around, so it might not have been the ones that were alarm calling. Some more up ahead, scampering across the road. Yeah, I'm a little bit of fun with the wind. I'm going to do it for you until this morning. Thank you. Jamie, I've got a Nyala coming out of the block between Nyala North and Haina Road, probably about opposite where that big tree fell over the road. The flies are out in force at the moment. So, Safari Dean says, wild do dog tracking is so frantic and exciting, while leopard tracking is relatively mellow but just as exciting. Well, uh, fortunately, leopards don't move at the same speed as wild dogs. Wild dog tracking is quite frantic because of the speed they move at, whereas leopards tend to take a slower approach to life. Being an ambush predator, they walk quite a lot more slowly and carefully and checking and looking for the right spot to make a stalk, whereas wild dogs will actually run their prey down they are courses as opposed to ambush predators. Well, Anna Marie says she's so in the mood to see a spotted feline. Oh dear, it flew off. Uh, it was a nice little butterfly that landed on that yellow comalina. Little flower there. Did you see the flower there? Zoom. There we go. Oh, no, that's a little bit... Where are you looking? Are you looking at the, oh, a little bit to the right? There. There we go, there's the yellow comalina.
haven't heard any alarm calls since we've been here. But it's possible that those, whatever was alarm calling at whatever predators around, might have skedaddled from the predator's presence. Genevieve, welcome Genevieve, who's in New York, would like to know, can an animal's flight or fight response vary between uh, the sexes? So between male and female, most definitely. And uh, a lot of that is all dependent on babies. So they'll have different flight and flight and fight responses uh, with the females depending on they have young uh, or not and with males it could be also in terms of defense whether they're defending uh, potential mates or uh, whether an elephant's in must so it, it, it can depend but yes it, it can vary between the sexes so carefully now in this lovely golden light and with how thick the bushes become makes the, those spotted felines that much more difficult to see so definitely worth taking one's time a little going slowly and checking Stop and listen again shortly. Just gonna stop up ahead where I can see a bit further down the road. And while we stop and listen, uh, let's go see if Jamie's had more luck than we have. I'm also checking very carefully. I've stopped to observe the behavior of this gray go away bird once again. So looking rather puffed up, but actually quite strange at this angle. Almost didn't realize what it was initially. This bird has been quiet the whole time. Um, and we did just pass a male kudu on Inyala Road North that looked much more relaxed than the kudu we saw earlier. An interesting one. And Brent and myself driving parallel to each other to try and see if we can't figure out where this leopard has gone to, or if indeed it is a leopard. Most likely it is, though. That makes the most sense, particularly with the tracks that Brent had this morning. So he's driving on the western side of this river system, and it's divided into a couple of different tributaries of really nice, perfect drainage line habitat, which leopards love to go in and hide in. And I think that's what... That's probably where Mvula is moving through. If it is, in, if indeed it is Mvula, it's also Gajina's new favorite area. <laughs> Anna Maria said perhaps I should say Karula's name and she might show up since all the animals seem to appear when mentioned. It's happened once or twice, I must say, and it's made for some wonderful, entertaining moments on Safari Live. Anna Marie, I will say that the one animal that's never worked with is Karula. Karula has a 
magnificent tendency to lose me about five minutes after I see her, which is fair enough. If she doesn't want company, she doesn't want company. I've had some, spe that being said, I've had some spectacular sightings with her as well, where she's, I've spent plenty of time with her and she's been perfectly relaxed. But she certainly doesn't appear at the, or she does tend to appear at the drop of a hat and then disappear again for days at a time. That's fairly normal behavior for her right now with cubs. We have absolutely no idea where she's now deading her cubs and where she's put them. We suspect that she might have moved them north back onto Juma. But to be completely honest, that's only because we've seen her tracks moving through the area fairly regularly. We absolutely do not know that for certain. And I find myself once again coming back to Buffles Hook Dam. I just have missed him. Brent mentioned that late October is a really nice time to come and visit the bush since there's very little vegetation and therefore you can see really nice and clearly into the vegetation. I mean at the moment after this rain it has become so thick in these drainage lines and even just on a normal road that spotting animals has become that much harder. Now, Megan, definitely late in October is a nice time to come, and it's also still, although it does get quite warm, it's still cool enough for the nocturnal animals to occasionally be scurrying about at night or at a sort of early evening. But you were wondering, when is the best time to see babies? And the answer to that is then, you, it depends which babies you want to see, of course. Baby leopards and baby lions you could see at any time of the year. They don't have a set breeding season. But if you want to see most antelope babies, then the time to be around is sort of around November, December, through to January and February, depending on which antelope you would like to see. Let's just check this path very carefully. I think we're a little bit further ahead of this leopard. I think it's still moving towards us rather than um, has already moved through this area. This is a perfect hiding place. Vula loves this drainage line system. He loves to tuck himself away in there. Oh. We seem to be back up. I'm actually going to stop at Bufflesook Dam because I feel a little bit trapped in terms of where I can go. I can't go north. I can't seem to go south either and I probably can't really go back. I suppose I could go straight back on myself and see if that doesn't work. But we're back at Bufflesook Dam. Voila. Having run out of any other options in terms of where we can go. The animals telling us where to find them, but the signal not necessarily keeping up with it. What I do want to do is race across to Buffles Hook Cut Line so that I have a slightly better signal. So what I'll do for now is send you across to Brent. I'll race across and I'll be back with you shortly. So we've looped through Hyena Road. We're now on the fire break and no tracks yet. So it is possible whatever as in Yala were alarming at is in that little dry river system that comes out of the Buffles Hook Dam. So I think what's going to happen is just in case the animal's going out of the way, Jamie and I are probably just going to swap routes and she's going to go down where we've just come from and we're going to go down where she's just come from. I heard a squirrel there for a second, but I did hear a squirrel. Let's go have a look. Hi, 
and says she absolutely loves it. We're going slowly, and she, we can stop and listen. She says she feels a lot closer to the bush. Well, we're going to go listen again shortly, Anne, don't you worry. That squirrel was alarming somewhere in this little dry river system. Now, of course, the problem with squirrels is being so small that lots of things eat them, so they find many reasons to alarm call through a day. Squirrel's gone quiet, not a good sign. Well, let's carry on check on the eastern side of this little dry riverbed. Clayton's wondering, are there times when animals' alarm calls might work to their disadvantage? I mean, it is, it is possible, Clayton, but normally uh, it'll work... It will almost always work to their advantage at the time. It might work to the predator that's being alarmed at's disadvantage. For example, if a leopard is being alarmed at and the lion's close by, the lion's... Or, and, and hyenas might go investigate what's being alarmed at. But generally, those alarm calls will notify all the other species. Uh, so for Nyala alarm, all the Impala and Kudu and Bushbuck will take notice of that and realize that there is a predator in the area. That looks like the elephants pushed a little branch over a little two track I want to take. Let me rephrase, more of a tree than a branch, so I'm just trying to sneak around it. Sure, I haven't used this little two-track in a long time. I think the last time was with Mvula, actually. And watch out, Dave, that is a very thorny tree. While we continue to check through here. Oh, well, as I said, while we continue to check through here, let's uh, go see if Jamie's having a little more luck than we are. Now, oh, this just gives Brent a chance to really concentrate on following up on those alarm calls. I've moved a little bit further out. So we're just listening 
in the bottom of this little river system now. Unfortunately, everything is quiet. Now, we often see the red, uh, brown ivory tree, which is the big one. Now, this is a red ivory tree next to us here. And I, was, I won't lie, I was looking for a little snack, but it doesn't look like any fruits on it at the moment. They've got tiny little red fruit that are incredibly sweet and tasty. But no fruits just yet. Strangely enough, the, the red ivories on my home reserve just outside Hootsprate, they've already fruited, but they did have a bit more rain this year than we have here. And fortunately, outside my bedroom, there's quite a big one. So often be found picking the red ivory fruit. Let's continue on. And we've got some Natal Franklin here, and they're looking quite relaxed. So let's see if we can get a view of them. And they scampered off. What was that? What was that little. What was that? Was that a little stenbook? Unusual to see a stenbook here. Oh, it was a bait. It was a diker. It was a diker. And he just ran through the middle of those Franklin. Now listen. Absolute panic. Now, did those Franklin suddenly get panicked by the running diker? Or did the running diker spark a predator to pop its head up? And we'll go have a look shortly. But I think, more than likely, they got panicked by the running diker. As you can see, we have, no one's used this little two-track road in a while. It's going to go round in case whatever we're looking for might have popped through past Buffalo's Hook on the other side. And just to really make sure we check this area extensively. Megan would like to know how many different types of squirrel do we get here? We have one, Megan. Uh, the Smith's bush squirrel, or just the bush squirrel. There are a few different types of bush squirrels throughout Africa, but here we only have one. And in South African, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, we only have three different types of squirrel, squirrel in the whole country. And that's not counting the exotic squirrels that live in Cape Town that were introduced by Cecil John Rhodes. And those are the same squirrels you would find uh, in the UK. Now, the indigenous squirrels, we have the little bush squirrel, which we see here. You have a red forest squirrel, or a red squirrel, that occurs uh, along coastal KwaZulu-Natal and uh, into Mozambique. And then in the, the very dry Kalahari areas, uh, you have the ground squirrels. So there's the three squirrel species for South Africa. So I'm pretty sure that those Franklin had a panic at the diker running through, but I'm just going to double check. We haven't heard anything else or seen anything else really, so we might as well just check. And hopefully I'm wrong, and it was the fact that the diker was spotted by a leopard who stood up, and that's what caused the squirrels to go Bananas, I mean, the squirrels, the Franklin to go bananas. But there is the Franklin. 
and he's looking quite relaxed now. So, as I said, pretty short sure was the diker, an old crested Franklin. Looking like there's a leopard close by just yet. Oh, we haven't used any of these roads in so long. They've become quite overgrown. Christopher, who's in Arizona, is wondering, are there any creepy crawlies that Jamie or I, or I are afraid of? Uh, speaking for myself, not really. I have some respect for. There's certain ones that irritate me immensely, such as uh, these little stable flies, these little biting flies, and, uh, of course, the mosquito. They're not afraid of, but I find them quite irritating. Uh, we've now come on that little road that comes through to the northern side of Buffelshook Dam, and, and there's that hippo, and he's got a hitchhiker at the moment. And it looks like a little, almost looks like that one could be a marsh terrapin from this distance. Let's have a closer look. No, it's a hinged terrapin. You can see the little angular spots on the top. A marsh terrapin's got a much flatter shell. OK, so not much has changed since you were here with Jamie a little while ago. past that hippopotami. Lucy in Indiana is wondering how far can a hippo's call be heard. Now, from a human point of view, you can probably hear it. Oh, look at that. That's quite interesting. Uh, from about, I don't know, maybe four or five kilometers. But if we look at the damn wall, you can see some elephants have had some great fun rubbing up against it. You can see that to the right there, Dave. Right, 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 right. There we go. You can see the Ellies have been having a great time leaning up and rubbing against the dam wall. And they're not here now. So there's a spot here that a lot of the leopards, a big animal path that a lot of the leopards and, who come through this area like to use. And it goes off down there. So just have a quick look if I can see a track on it. The ground's very hard at the moment. I'm just going to have a, a look a little bit further to where it's a bit softer there, and then we'll continue on. Just hyena tracks, unfortunately. So I'm going to loop again around now to the sort of southeastern side of this little riverbed. So while we moving on, let's just have a quick look at another flower. And there we go. Down, Dev. The purple ones. There we go. 
Here we go, a little solanum or poison apple. So the fruits will start off as green and they will become yellow and they are highly noxious. But very interesting about this plant as we move on, the Malagasy people of Madagascar will eat the fruit as a rite of passage. So, let's take on one second, sorry. I spotted something, I just want to make sure it's an, a stick, not a crocodile, and it is a stick. I thought it might be a crocodile on Buffalo's hook for a second, but it's not, it's just a stick. But so, the Malagasy, when they're coming into manhood, will eat the poison apple, which is highly poisonous when it's ripe. So they eat it when it's green, uh, and it doesn't have any effect, but when it is yellow and ripe, it is very poisonous, and it can kill you if you eat it. But so, uh, young Malagasy boys, in their passage to manhood, are made to eat the non-poisonous version, uh, the green version. And it is related to tomatoes that little plant. We might have a bit of signal break up in the bottom of this hill. So it looks like Jamie has had a gremlin outbreak, um, a technological gremlin. So it's eating her signal and tech team are busy with gremlin exterminating tools, trying to get rid of them, so you are stuck with me for now. So Aqua says she loves the gardenia I was talking about earlier and very wonderful scented flower. And she's wondering, do we have any jasmine plants here? Yes, in fact we do, we have two different species. I haven't seen either of them flowering this year, but I will keep my eye out. They could start flowering now that we've had that little bit of rain. Uh, when I used to live at Londolozi, I actually transplanted a ja uh, jasmine and grew it all over my wall. Mandy is wondering, are there any exotic flowers in the bloom? And Mandy, yes, there are. We have one particularly nasty exotic flower called the Red Star Zena, and there's a few of them on, in bloom on quarantine at the moment. But the one good thing about this really dry weather is it did seriously deplete their numbers this year. the Lone Star State, Texas. And she's watching with a friend of hers and her friend's son, who is nine years old, and his name is Aiden. Hi, Aiden. Aiden would like to know, do we have a fish in any of these pans or dams? Uh, and how big can the catfish get? Well, the ones in the Arethusa dam. Well, we don't really, I, and me as an avid fisherman, uh, the fishing's not so great in there. There's pretty much only catfish left in a lot of the pans after the drought. There might still be some tilapia at Areth Arethusa, but uh, how big can the catfish get? Uh, well, this particular species, probably in Arethusa, you're probably looking at about 20 pounds, 25 pounds being the biggest. Uh, it is the sharp tooth catfish. Strangely enough, for those in Florida, it is actually a very big problem in Florida. It's one of the invasive fish species that's wiping out the local uh, freshwater fish populations in, in Florida. Along with lots, Florida's got a lot of uh, bad uh, exotic fish, uh, the sharp tooth catfish, snakehead, um, peacock bass. So a, a lot of exotics being introduced into, into the waterways of Florida. But this particular catfish species 
uh, the sharp-toothed catfish is one of the biggest freshwater species in, in Africa, and it can reach weights um, of around 75 kilograms, and I'm not quite sure what that is in, it's over 100, well over 100 pounds, probably close on 200 pounds. I'm trying to remember now. 45 kgs is 100 pounds. So, yes, just under 200 pounds uh, that sharp-toothed catfish can get. So, just listening again. And they're incredibly adaptable fish. They can breathe air um, from gulping air. They can also breathe through their gills. And they can also cross land. They can walk between different bodies of water as they dry up. And they can do up to a couple of kilometers to get to another water source. And, oops, sorry, there's a spider web. Okay. Very upset Franklin just exploded out of the bush and flying from the ground up, which means it's a terrestrial threat, a threat on the ground and not an aerial threat. So could it be that the Franklin are going to give us the final clue to find whatever those Anyala that Jamie heard alarming were looking at? So they took off out of here. Sounding very upset. Have your eyes scanning. Good man. But while we search, I'll chat a bit more about catfish species in Africa. Now, we do have a lot. The most widespread is that sharp-toothed catfish. And my personal best is around 30 kilograms. And I haven't been fishing in a while. I think my next leave, I'm going to go fishing again. Those are the ones that were alarming. Come on, kitty cat. Where are you hiding? Keep quiet here and listen again for a second. Maybe we'll get another clue. Oh, Safari Dean's wondering, are there many species of animal that have been intro introduced into South Africa? Now, uh, we do have the odd exotic species, but not too many. Quite often, in certain cases, the indigenous species will outcompete. But in the farming areas of KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape, and I think also the Western Cape, there are some exotic or feral populations of fallow deer that were introduced from England. We probably have a few more exotic bird species, and of course the squirrels in Cape Town. But probably one of the worst exotic species introduced uh, is a bird called the Indian miner, which is a type of starling, but very aggressive and often outcompetes indigenous bird species by attacking their nests and breaking them up and killing their babies. 
and they breed incredibly quickly, and they're highly intelligent. It's one of the few bird species you can teach to talk. I'm trying to think now. I think probably the biggest invasive species problem is with plants. Uh, bugweed, lantana, uh, chromalina, prickly pears. Black and black wattle, blue gum. Well, early in an Aylin, I'm oh, sorry, early in an Aiden, it's my absolute pleasure to answer that question. Aiden, I love to fish as well, and I've been lucky. I've fished all over the place, all over the world, and all over Africa. It's very seldom that I leave home without my travel fishing rod, which is a little fly rod that fits into about this much. So I always have a fishing rod with me. Fishing rod and the camera. Can't go anywhere without them. OK, so nothing further. I'm going to try sneak a little bit further down this road. Probably go a little bit longer, and then we'll stop and listen again. So we had a look at a marula tree and a false marula tree. Unfortunately, this is not a good spot to see either uh, where we are at the moment. But Clayton is wondering why do they call it a false marula and what is the difference? Well, it has a similar bark, but not quite the same, and a, and a slightly similar shape to a marula. So if you don't know the trees too well, uh, that's easy to confuse them. But I think for me, the biggest difference is if you look at the leaves, the false marula leaves are very shiny and waxy, whereas uh, the normal marula leaves are, are quite a lot sort of more dull and paler. Absolutely no tracks. It's going to have to think remain a mystery to what those in Yala were alarming, alarming at. Maybe they saw their own shadow. Lynn says she bets a leopard's going to show up before the end of drive, uh, according to final control. Lynn, we have one minute and 20 seconds for that to happen in. Lynn, I do hope you are right. Closer in case it flies. So there we go. So there we have one of our vagrants who hasn't departed yet. A cuckoo. Now, which cuckoo is it? So we have two cuckoos that are black and white and look quite similar. That's going to be quite difficult to tell from this particular position. So it's either a Jacobin or a Levalance. I'm going to try sneak a little bit closer. So the Levalance has a very. Oh, he moved. A streaky breast, as a Jacobin has a white breast. Where did he go? You got him? Dave says he's got him. So again, facing the wrong way for us to get a nice ID. But if we're patient, ah oh, no, there we go. So a Levalance cuckoo. There's another one. Well done, Dave. You can see that streaky breast of the Levalance cuckoo. Beautiful bird. And it's going to be leaving shortly. 
and heading for warmer climbs as soon as we start getting a bit colder. Very noisy cuckoos, but not a particularly pretty call. So, most of you guys will know that cuckoos are what we call brood parasites. And for those who are not sure what... Are they moving, Dave? No, one. one to... So, brood parasites. Uh, oh, there you guys. Let me just see. I'm going to move forward a bit. The other ones going to sit out in the open there nicely. You got them? There we go. So brood parasit parasites will lay their eggs in other birds' nests and let the other birds do all the work. So it is a very interesting life strategy. And from their size, they generally like to match their, their babies with normal sized, or a, a bird to similar sizes. But these guys are very, very... I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting washed up there. Oh, off it goes. But their favorite uh, brood parasite, so the species of bird that they will choose to lay their eggs in, in this area, is almost exclusively arrow-marked babblers. Uh, and in other areas, they, do, they also choose the other babbler species. And uh, I said they didn't have the nicest call, so I will play it for you. Why is it not working? Uh, technology is getting to me again. There we go. There's that call. Not the nicest, but very distinct. So, speaking of cuckoos, Siberia who's one of our zoomies, would like to know what the call of a black cuckoo sounds like. So, uh, where I was taught a black cuckoo when I was learning to bird as a young boy, was, he says, I'm so sad. <whistles> but let's let the bird do the talking, probably a bit better than me. There we go. So sad. There we go. That is the black cuckoo. Megan says, thank you to FC, Jamie and Brent for answering all my questions today. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Well, Megan, we've enjoyed answering your questions. Here we go. White-backed vultures getting on the move as it gets warmer, looking for the thermals. So after these cold, overcast days, they will be ecstatic that they get to ride the hot air waves in search of something to munch upon. So, oh, into the sun he went. So you can see a big bird like a vulture takes a lot of energy to flap those wings. So that's why they've developed that skill of finding those thermals, the hot air rising off the ground, and then they'll just get into that hot air, lock off their wings, and ride the thermal in a circular motion until they get to their chosen height. And from there, they can glide about and see if there's anything dead for them to eat. Evie in Long Island is wondering, 
if I know which bird flies at the highest height uh, and what height it could be. Evie, I'm not sure exactly if there's which is the, the highest of the high. I know vultures have been recorded at the same height as commercial airliners, which I think is, I can't remember exactly how high that is. Um, ugh, I'm trying to rack my brain. I used to know. Yeah, I think uh, my brain wants to say 32,000 feet above sea level. Uh, and also, strange enough, little swallows. Barn or European swallows have also been recorded at that height. So I don't think there's going to be too many birds that can top them. But I, as I said, I might be completely wrong. So I'd say probably vultures um, and possibly some of the other big, uh, big, big predatory eagles. But I think vultures are the top of the, the pops. And strange enough, another flying thing we see a lot around here that has also been recorded at 32,000 feet, I think, I'm pretty sure it is 32,000 feet now, is a dung beetle. Can you believe it? Yes, yeah, so dung beetles have been recorded as high as commercial airliners. Whether it's 32,000 feet or around there, uh, I'm not 100% sure. I'm trying to rack my brain to remember. There we go. So it was it was 30, but not 32, 37,000 feet, and it was the Rupel's vulture. So we do occasionally, very rarely, get Rupel's vultures down here in southern Africa. They sort of arrive as lost individuals, uh, but they are more common up in East Africa uh, along the Serengeti, Great Rift Valley. Uh, Rupel's vultures are quite common. So they have been recorded at 37,000 feet, which is the height of a commercial airliner, and also. The second highest flying animal is uh, the bar-tailed goose, who has been recorded at 28,000 foot. So obviously that single swallow that was seen there was very confused. Maybe a bit light-headed with altitude sickness. Well, the Step Brothers would like to know what is the fastest flying bird. Now, there is one who beats all birds, and that is the peregrine falcon in its dive to pounce on birds from above. So a peregrine falcon will actually fly, will see a dove or other bird it wants to eat above, and it'll plummet straight down, hits it in the middle of the back, and then lock its, its talons in, and uh, the peregrine falcon gets to terminal velocity which is around 200 and something kilometers an hour, if I remember correctly. So that is the fastest bird. Uh, and most deadly bird, well, it, it, it depends uh, on what you are. If you are a snake, the most deadly bird out here for you is either going to be a ground hornbill or a secretary bird. If you are a dove, it's going to be the peregrine falcon or one of the little acceptors, the little goshawks or sparrowhawks. Uh, if you are a flying ant, it could be any bird. Uh, if you are a small antelope, it's going to be the martial eagle, which is the biggest eagle we get here. There we go. I was spot on. Terminal velocity is 200 kilometers an hour. Uh, but we are drawing to the end of the sunrise safari. And unfortunately, Jamie is still infested with gremlins. Hopefully, the tech team will be able to sort that out. But it looks like the leopards continue to evade us. Well, no lions on property. There is, I'm convinced there are leopards here. We just haven't been able to find them. Hopefully our luck will change on the sunset safari and there'll just be a plethora of leopards and, oh, excuse me, at every corner. So from Dave, myself, and Jamie, and uh, Jean-Dre, we'll see you this afternoon.